All right, so the next section we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about mold and metals. And uh, mold is one of these things that you're going to find everywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live in the country, where you live in the world, you're always going to have mold to contend with. Some places are worse than others. Uh, obviously, places where there's a lot of moisture, a lot of humidity, uh, you're going to see uh, more mold. Uh, I happen to have practices in Connecticut and California, and I was surprised that I actually see more mold problems in California than I see in Connecticut, which seemed very counterintuitive to me because Connecticut's got a bunch of old buildings and stuff like that. The problem I find out in, when you're in drier climates, when people get mold, they don't know they have mold. It's behind a refrigerator that's leaking. It's behind a, a faucet that's been dripping. Uh, it seems like when you live in places that have basements, you know, they see leaking eventually make its way to the basement and they can identify it. So uh, don't, don't be surprised if you start finding mold in, with your patients that live in places that are not typically known to have a lot of uh, moisture. And I think it's good to understand the difference with mold, that you have mold allergy and mycotoxicity. Uh, the two are really two very different processes. Some molds actually secrete mycotoxins, which are directly toxic to both the brain, the nervous system, and the lungs, which is different than the immune reaction to mold spores. So we're going to talk about desensitization against mold spores, but it's different than the way that you treat mycotoxicity, and that's a whole under lecture unto itself. Uh, but I do want you to understand that there is a difference between the two. One of the things I find when dealing with mold, or at least testing for mold, which you'll find in the conventional allergy world, is they often only test people for just a handful of molds. And again, this is where it's really important to understand your environment, your local area, because the molds, again, can be a little bit different from region to region. So uh, you can go online, or there's even textbooks out there that describe what kind of molds are generally dominant in your area. The other thing with mold allergy that can make it a bit challenging to identify is a lot of mold reactions don't involve IgE. So if you're doing conventional skin prick testing or RAS testing, uh, don't be surprised if they come back negative. And yet your patient will describe, you know, gosh, every time it's raining, every time it's humid, every time I go into a damp basement, I get a headache, I get congested, I start sneezing. You know, you'll see these clinical features of allergy, uh, yet their IgE testing came back negative. So you just know that it's a different kind of immune reaction that's involved. And again, this is where some of these other techniques that we talked about earlier can be helpful in identifying mold reactions in your patients. So some of the symptoms you're going to see, of course, you know, allergic rhinitis, the runny nose, the itchy eyes, asthma. I see a ton of people that get cognitive impairment when they're in a moldy environment. The brain fog, the, the, the memory loss, they forget where they put their keys, that kind of stuff. You'll also see a lot of psychiatric symptoms, mood problems, depression is very common. Uh, I've seen people who completely change when they get in moldy environments. I had one patient years ago who would legitimately get suicidal every time it rained, and it was really very challenging for her. Uh, nasal congestion, that dry hacking cough that you'll hear in some patients. Uh, if it's not mycoplasma, there's a good chance it's mold allergy. Headaches, reactive airway disease, scratchy throat can all be signs of mold reactivity. Some of the common molds, just as kind of a laundry list of things that I test for in my practice, uh, this is not obviously a complete list of everything, but these are ones that are pretty common throughout at least the United States. Alternaria, Aspergillus, Botrytis, Cephalosporium. Ketone and Stachybotrys are these two molds that when you see on a patient's mold report, if they ever get their homes or work tested, these are the toxic molds. These are the ones that have a high probability of causing mycotoxicity. Uh, ketomium you're going to see more in areas that have a lot of like woody stuff, uh, bark and branches. That's more of an outdoor kind of mold where stachybotrys is that black mold you get from water damaged buildings. Uh, fusarium, mucor, penicillium, pulularia, rhizopus, smuts, uh, particularly if you live in farm country, and stemphilium is a leaf mold. So where I live in the Northeast, uh, the fall is the worst time for my mold sensitive patients. As all the leaves fall off the trees and everyone's out with their mold blowers, uh, they have terrible times uh, when their leaves are, are out. And yeast also to consider, uh, again, depending on where you live in the country, uh, coccidioides, if you live in you know, the southwestern U.S., of course, Candida, uh, Cryptococcus, uh, Epidermophyton, Geotrichum, Histoplasma, Microsporum, Trichophyton. Uh, the Trichophyton, Microsporum, Epidermophyton, Candida, 
These also can be common skin yeast. These are common causes of ringworm. So particularly for patients who happen to present that way. Uh, although I've seen a lot of patients that just get a lot of nasal symptoms that when you test them, they will test positive for these skin yeasts. So we call them skin yeast, but they're clearly not confined to the skin. Uh, a little comment about toxic metals. You know, yesterday we talked a lot about toxic metals and, of course, their toxic effect. But be aware that there can also be an immune effect when people get exposed to these toxic metals. So it can kind of be a double whammy where you've got the, the toxicity of things like mercury, lead, and arsenic, but now you've got this secondary potential immune reaction to the metal that sort of compounds the problem. And, of course, we find these metals everywhere in the environment that the byproduct of industrial pollution, uh, it's in some vaccines, of course, that contain aluminum and the flu vaccine that has thimerosal. Uh, and again, we just find these, uh, these heavy metals sort of ubiquitous throughout nature. Arsenic, you know, we find is a result of industrial pollution, certain pesticides and herbicides. Uh, it's even found in some medications, believe it or not. Wood preservatives, so pressure treated wood. My uh, neighbor uh, decided to get a, a bunny rabbit for their daughter. And the father-in-law was going to be really sweet, decided to build a rabbit cage. And the next day, the rabbit was dead. He decided to use pressure-treated wood. And this was before the days that they got the arsenic out of it. And, of course, the rabbit was chewing on the wood all night. And that was not uh, compatible with life. So uh, you'll see that in the old pressure-treated wood. Uh, rice, chicken, and apples are food sources that are commonly known to contain high levels of arsenic either because of what's naturally in the soil, or in the case of chicken, it's what they feed the chickens. In the case of apples, it's a combination of the pesticides they use to preserve apples, plus the uptake from the apple tree roots. And of course, areas are near volcanic eruptions secrete a lot of arsenic. Cadmium, you know, cigarette smoking is probably the most common uh, source of cadmium. Uh, batteries, again, it's in industrial pollution, usually from the production of mining, smelting, batteries. Uh, food sources, you find it in some cases in liver, mushroom, shellfish, mussels, cocoa, and dried seaweed. Uh, hexavalent chromium, you know, this was the, uh, the movie Aaron Brockovich, the, the case of Hinkley, California, where PG&E was using this as part of their industrial processing. It got into the town water and made a lot of people very, very ill. Uh, again, we'll find this in, in industries that are involved in metal processing, tanneries, uh, stainless steel welding, and other places that use uh, chrome as a uh, pigment. Lead, uh, you'll find everywhere. Obviously, we don't have lead in paint anymore, but any of these old buildings prior to 1970 used a lot of lead paint. It's also a very common contaminant in fish and shellfish. You know, we always talk a lot about mercury contamination in fish, and I think a lot of people forget there's as much lead as there is mercury in a lot of our fish supply. Uh, obviously, older paint, ceramic products, old crystals used to contain lead. Uh, a family member of mine had gotten me some of this really nice older china, and uh, we had it tested for lead that was sky high. Of course, they had no idea. So some of that old uh, ceramic stuff is pretty toxic. Of course, burning of fossil fuels and even some of that really cheap jewelry out there, they use lead in it. Mercury, again, fish and shellfish are extremely common. Amalgam fillings of course, have a lot of mercury. Uh, vaccines, uh, especially the multi-dose vials of flu vaccine uh, contain mercury, all of them do. And even some of the DTaP and meningococcus vaccines. So they've said that, no, no, there's no more mercury in vaccines. It's only partially true. What they've done is they've reduced it below what the EPA considers safe in some cases, but in the flu vaccines, there's still actually fairly high doses of uh, thimerosal. Industrial pollution, jewelry, glass products, and even a lot of these anti-aging skin products. Uh, there is a company, and I forget their name, but uh, they market skin whitening to non-white people, and a lot of those do contain uh, mercury. So uh, I want to spend more of the time really talking about cases here to kind of help uh, solidify some of this information. So the first case I had here, uh, she was a 48-year-old female. She was referred to me by a colleague of mine for treatment of Lyme disease. And when she came in, she complained of neck pain, hip pain, fatigue, headaches, nasal congestion. She had neuropathy in both her feet and this sort of diffuse abdominal pain for about three years. She said her bowel movements were regular. She didn't have constipation or diarrhea. And she had this right upper quadrant pain. Uh, the previous doctor who had referred her had tested her for SIBO. She was positive and she was treated. Um, 
and as far as they were concerned, the SIBO was taken care of. So I started treating her Lyme disease with using Chinese herbs and uh, a biofilm protocol, which are enzymes, and uh, just gave her some general nutritional support. I saw her a month later, and uh, her neck and joint pain were much better. Her energy was a little bit better, but she was still getting a lot of headaches and nasal congestion, and her neuropathy hadn't changed at all. She still had the right upper quadrant pain, but it was a little bit better. So I continued with the treatment as before, and I added in uh, Lyme. Uh, this LDI is low-dose immunotherapy. This is a way of modulating the way the immune system reacts to different microbes. So if you imagine the immune system's reacting to a microbe like an allergen instead of a pathogen, that becomes a bit of a problem. And I think a lot of these microbes, including Lyme disease, have the capacity to trigger this autoimmune event. And so this is a way of modulating that overreaction to the organism. So it's not designed to kill the organism. It's not designed to stop the immune system from fighting the infection. It's really trying to turn off that autoimmune reaction to the bug. And in this case, it was to Lyme disease. So six weeks after that, her joint neck pain were gone. Uh, she had significant improvement from the LDI. Her neuropathy was also better. Energy was better. But that right upper quadrant pain was still nagging her. Still had the headaches, nasal congestion, and now the weather started to change. We were moving into fall, and she noticed that, uh, actually, this was September, so we, it, was, it was actually getting very humid in Connecticut. And uh, she noticed with the humidity, she was getting worse. So I decided to go ahead and start testing her for mold allergies, and I ran a stool test on her. So when I did her allergy testing, she was... Uh, Allergic to alternaria at a 7, aspergillus at a 7, botrytis at a 7, cladosporium at an 8, helminthosporium at a 6, penicillium at a 7, mucor at a 6, and stem filum at a 7. So we were able to go through, identify what molds were bothering her and what her endpoints were. Uh, did the stool test, and actually nothing came back on that. So we still continued with her treatment, and I started her on sublingual immunotherapy at one drop three times a day for the molds as listed there. Six weeks after that, her joint pain was still good, her energy was still continuing improving, but now we finally got a dent into her headaches and her nasal congestion. And she said that they improved by about 75%. Uh, she still had head pressure when it rained, but much better. Her neuropathy was also better by about 25%. So I went ahead and basically doubled her dose of sublingual immunotherapy. Instead of one drop three times a day, we bumped her up to two drops three times a day. Uh, two weeks later, she called me and she said her right upper quadrant pain got a lot worse. Uh, so I went ahead and I sent her in for an ultrasound and it came back and she had a dilated common bile duct. I actually called the radiologist and they said, oh yeah, you know, we see this all the time. I said, oh, okay, what does that mean? Oh, we don't know. So <laughs> that wasn't very helpful. And they said, well, you know, get an MRCP. So I sent her out for an MRCP and that came back really unremarkable. So at this point, I wasn't really sure what was causing this upper uh, right upper quadrant pain. So I said, look, go ahead and stop all of your supplements and let's just make sure that that's not causing the problem. So she stopped everything for a week. Nothing changed in her pain. So I went ahead and had her go back on everything that she was taking because her other symptoms were getting better. Now, she had a history of being on antibiotics prior to seeing me. So I was wondering if, you know, perhaps there had been some sort of fungal issue that might have uh, not shown up on CDSA. Um, you know, I was a microbiologist before I was a doctor, and the one thing you should know about yeast is that it's really hard to grow out in culture. And, you know, with the best labs out there, there are some yeast that it's just hard to replicate what happens in the body. So when you see a negative culture on no matter what lab you use for your stool test, unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a yeast there it might be something that's very hard to pick up. If you're ever really concerned about yeast and you know your stool test keeps coming back negative, I'll run an organic acid test because a lot of times on the urine test, you'll see these elevated yeast markers even though it doesn't culture out on a stool test. So that's a good way to kind of double check and make sure you're not missing some sort of underlying fungal problem. So I went to go inside and test her for candida and other yeasts. And sure enough, she tested positive for candida at a six and geotrichum at seven. Uh, her symptoms were pretty much stable and unchanged, uh, even though her right upper quadrant pain had worsened. So I continued with all of her other treatments, and now we started her on sublingual immunotherapy at one drop twice a day under the tongue. 
I find for whatever reason with the yeast, uh, I don't have to use as much of the sublingual immunotherapy as I do when I'm treating for foods and other types of allergens. That's just been my, my experience. So she called me two days later and the right upper quadrant pain was 80% improved just after being on the yeast and the, the, the candida and the geotrichum. Her energy also improved quite a bit. She was at a five or six out of 10 and she went to a nine out of 10. She felt like she was starting to eat more foods without pain. Her appetite was improving. She still didn't have any joint or neck pain. The neuropathy was still there, but it was continuing to improve. So we continued on her treatment. Um, I followed her for now. It's been, you now it's been a little over two years. And she's really completely symptom-free at this point. And what's interesting, in fact, I just got labs on her yesterday, and she still has these very low-level autoimmune markers. She's got mild Hashimoto's, and just, you know, her A&E is like a 1 to 40. But symptomatically, she's actually feeling really well. So our, we're going to continue on with the immunotherapy because it's been very successful for her. And, and she's been on drops this, this, this whole time. I have not had to change her dose. She's, she's been stable at this maintenance dose. And uh, our next step actually is we're going to put her through a detox program uh, just to try and help improve some of the autoimmunity. In fact, she just completed a three-week ski trip around the United States, skiing all day. You know, the, you know, she does the double black diamond. So that tells me she's feeling pretty well if she can manage that. And the next case is Dr. Willoughby's. Right. Okay, this is a 63-year-old um, obese white female, uh, appeared very fatigued. Uh, she's a medical biller, presents with complaints of fatigue, headache, dizziness, hay fever, chronic ear problems, recurrent sinusitis, swelling of the lips, tongue, mouth, and throat, tightness in the chest, vomiting, diarrhea, joint aches, muscle aches, rashes, and hives. Um, she had a proven hit, proven food allergies, including soy, dairy, yeast, peanuts, almonds, and eggs. Pain medications, she had found 36 different pain meds of varying kinds that caused headache um, and other symptoms. Cardiac medications were tried. Uh, blood thinners, uh, for blood thinners, she had atrial fib, hypertension. And these would cause dizziness, severe headache, swelling, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and hives. Now, following a motor vehicle accident, excuse me, I mistyped that, rotator cuff and hip surgeries failed to heal with complications of swelling, hives, and other rashes. She found that certain clothing, especially wool, would cause hives. She was referred by one of the local uh, pediatric allergists who had taken care of her, and she felt she'd done really well with injection immunotherapy for spring and fall pollens, dust mite, molds, cockroach, cat, and dog. Um, she'd reported 90% relief of hay fever, however, has extreme flares sometime in the spring, the fall, and especially early winter. Uh, with elimination of known food allergens, symptoms occurred two to four times monthly when shots are working. Uh, however, episodes become more frequent during hay fever flares, and her hypothyroid is treated with Synthroid. She had a TSH of 160 when she was first diagnosed. Her biggest concerns were continuation of immunotherapy, improving the control of her food allergies, and reactions that she had following surgeries with inability to heal. Um, and again, this uh, lady grew up in Iowa. As an infant, she had irritability, colic, rashes, and ear infections. So you pretty well know she's got some food sensitivities right off the bat. As a toddler, she developed hay fever with eye, <clears throat> ear, and nasal symptoms, developed hives and diarrhea. She had a burst eardrum at age four. Uh, in elementary school, she began developing hives and uh, angioedema with peanuts. In high school, she developed more fatigue, rashes with jewelry, and worsening of food allergies. During college, she had no changes. As an adult, she had worsening of all symptoms. She had an inability to heal after surgeries, and she'd been through quite a number. She was a you know, skeletal, musculoskeletal, uh, was in trouble. She had dizziness, swelling, and cough from perfumes and disinfectants, 
and skin blistering and peeling with adhesive dressings. She had multiple menstrual irregularities and spontaneous abortions. Followed her second pregnancy, you know, following her second pregnancy, they diagnosed her with hypothyroid when they found a TSH of 160, which you don't see that very often. Review of her two-week diet, <clears throat> symptom diary revealed wheat and dairy were consumed daily. Um, and she agreed to try testing for one of those two foods. Uh, she didn't want to spend any money. And uh, with, we used, with her, we used intracutaneous provocation neutralization. And the wheat induced fatigue, cough, joint pain, ear and nasal congestion, and milk induced a cough, nasal congestion, and GI distress. Um, she had, you know, actually, she'd actually had previous testing for celiac disease, which was negative. And she opted against paying for treatment, but agreed to eliminate wheat and milk for a six-week week period. Uh, we did serial endpoint titration for the allergens included in her previous immunotherapy, and she actually chose to use sublingual immunotherapy for convenience because uh, she didn't want to come in the office to get a shot and didn't like getting shots anyway. And we poked, escalated the potency to a maximum tolerated dose on all those. She tolerated it well. Uh, her lab came back. She had a TSH of 11.71, free T4 of 0.9, a free T3 of 3.7, but she had a reverse T3 of 675, which is a little elevated. She also had a thyroglobulin antibody of 365 and peroxidase antibody of 8, so it's no wonder that with eating all the wheat and, and milk, she developed Hashimoto's. Um, you know, the only other th remarkable things were she had a high level of eosinophils, and her 25 hydroxy D3 was 22.5. You need to look at this on everybody because it's, it's horrible. It's an epidemic, as you all know. We did change her thyroid supplementation to Armour Thyroid, 60 milligrams, one by mouth twice daily. That was done because she was just totally running out of steam about three or four in the afternoon. And again, I, I started with a pretty high dose of vitamin D, 50,000 international units once daily for 15 days and then 10,000 daily uh, thereafter. Um, and at that time, well, we'd also added the K2, K2 into that vitamin D to help her. Um, she came back and reported her hay fever symptoms were under great control with reduced frequency and severity of food reactions with elimination of wheat and milk products. And again, her energy was vastly improved. I think a lot of that was food allergy as well as thyroid. Um, she'd had a weight loss and was feeling well in general until a week prior. She'd had a fall and experienced a comminuted compound fracture of the forearm and had a metal plate inserted. Within two days, she developed swelling, generalized itching hives, and a, a rash uh, on the, at the incision line. Um, and she'd had a previous history, as I stated, since a teenager of dermatitis related to jewelries and other metals. Uh, we talked about doing some PN testing. The other options we talked about were um, um, doing some laboratory tests. She opted to do a Clifford test uh, for related ortho materials. We found 22 chemical families and materials were shown to be reactive. Three weeks post-surgery, there was no evidence of healing and symptoms continued. We did find an orthopedist who agreed to remove the plate and replace the device with appropriate materials. And at that time, we gave her Depomedrol 80 milligrams intramuscularly and a prednisone taper, which relieved her symptoms. Following removal of the plate and replacement with compatible materials, all those symptoms resolved and that that time we decided we would try LDA because she was tired of her diet. And with that, she increased her tolerance to all foods and chemicals. Um, and she chose to do it sublingual. She was tired of all the shots and all that from her previous treatment. So we just uh, began that with a low-dose food since she had had a history of anaphylaxis and other severe problems. 
Um, and we utilize the inhalants and the CF mix, which is more or less the chemical mix. Uh, after her first dose, she experienced two days of fatigue, then felt markedly better. After three weeks, the inhalant symptoms began to recur. And with this, you know, we shouldn't do immunotherapy, they say, but we let her have a dose of her sublingual immunotherapy, and that relieved doses pretty immediately. Eight weeks following the initial sublingual LDA, she reported good control, um, supplementing with slint as necessary. Her weight had dropped from 213 pounds to 191. Energy approved, improved, excuse me. Swelling was gone, and she could tolerate occasional consumption of some foods except wheat and milk. She'd been able to attend her grandchildren's sports events and activities and go to public places without a reaction. And we gave her a second LDA, and things just went smoothly, relieving most symptoms. Um, she's pleased. Inhalant symptoms have been absent. She tolerates, you know, all foods, even milk and wheat, but we still give her lectures because that, that can cause other problems with inflammatory disease and fumes don't bother. The weight's decreased to 180 pounds. She only requ required one sublingual um, immunotherapy inhalant booster with that second dose, and since the time she continues the sublingual LDA, Armour Thyroid 60 BID, and continues vitamin D, 10,000 IUs daily. And now she has progressed to the point where sublingual LDA is required every six to eight months, and she's pretty happy lady. That's it. Great. Thanks, Jim. So uh, our third case here, uh, this is a 36-year-old female, uh, was presenting with right ankle pain following surgery after she fractured her lateral malleolus uh, in a snowboarding accident. So she had had surgery three months prior, and she still had some redness, some itchy, and pain in the ankle. She had a post-op visit with the surgeon, and he felt like she was healing well. There was no sign of infection. Uh, it just seemed like it was red and irritated. Otherwise, she was pretty healthy and really didn't have any other complaints. Uh, as part of her surgery, they did put in a wire to help heal the fracture. Uh, when she fractured it, she managed to break it in quite a few places, so it wasn't a single, single clean fracture. So uh, that's part of why they put the wire in. And on visual examination, you had a slightly erythematous right lateral malleolus, small firm protrusion in the superficial fascia. So as I was palpating, you could feel like there was something sticking out. And I asked her about it, uh, and she was unaware of what it was. Uh, so I had her talk to the surgeon about what materials were used during the surgery. And uh, the wire he used was a stainless steel uh, wire. We actually got the insert from the company, and it did have an aluminum alloy in it. So uh, PN testing found that she was reactive at aluminum at a 3 and a 4. And then the complaint ankle was more painful. It looked more red, but it actually, at a 5, she said that she actually felt a lot better. So we went ahead and started her on a sublingual for aluminum at one drop three times a day. After one week, she felt like her, the pain in her ankle was a little bit less and it looked less red. And three weeks following that, it continued to improve, but she still had symptoms. After six weeks, she was still symptomatic, and now the wire was literally poking through the skin. You know, it's almost like her body had this innate wisdom that it wanted it out. So uh, we had continued with the slit, but uh, the surgeon said at that point that the wire had to come out. Uh, so he uh, removed the wire, and shortly after the wire was removed and she had just the surgical healing of pulling it out, uh, she had really no further symptoms. So it's really good to know, you know, when you have patients that have implants, to know what went in their body. And as much as they like to say, oh, no, no, this is normal, you know, you're not going to have a reaction. I've seen people with various prosthetics that start having problems in the joint after they've had the surgery. So if you can find out what materials were used, uh, there might be a way that you can help desensitize your patients. You know, obviously, if somebody has a hip replacement, you can't exactly pull it out, but uh, there might be a way that you can help modulate the way the immune system is reacting to these things. You know, these things are foreign to the body. It is natural for the body to not want plastics and metals in the body. So if there's a way that you can help alleviate that, you're going to help a lot of people. 
Uh, fourth case here, this was a six-year-old male with uh, typical flexural eczema and atopic dermatitis that covered about 80% of his skin. Uh, most kids I see with eczema coincide with having a lot of GI issues. Uh, this particular child did not, nor did he have really any other kind of uh, atopic illness. He didn't have asthma. He didn't have a runny nose. Uh, so we tested him for uh, food sensitivities. And in my practice, uh, we actually test for phenolics. This could probably be, again, a whole other lecture on its own, but uh, phenolics uh, were really kind of brought to light by Robert Gardner. He's a PhD, and he wrote a book back in the, I think, the, the 60s uh, about phenolic sensitivities. And he himself is a plant biologist, and he had terrible food problems. So his allergist says, well, look, you're a PhD. Go figure it out. And what we discovered is that these single molecules, these phenolics, do tend to trigger reactions. But the reaction, again, is a delayed reaction. So it's not your stereotypical IgE reaction. So I trained with a doctor who trained with a doctor who trained with Gardner. So uh, that's where I learned about phenolic sensitivities. So when I tested this child, it came out that uh, phenyl isothiocyanate and piperin, you probably never heard of these before, but PITC is one that we find a lot in dairy products. Uh, piperin is very big in the nightshade foods. And uh, this combination is actually very common in people I see with eczema. So we had him do food avoidance and then uh, gave him some uh, vitamin C, vitamin A, zinc, and fish oil. They're all nutritive to help with skin repair. Uh, I saw him a month later and his skin was better by about 20%. Didn't have any new lesions, and the old lesions were starting to heal. He's scratching less. They've been really good about his diet and taking the supplements and taking his immunotherapy drops. So uh, with phenolic sensitivities, I retest people every month because what we'll typically see is we'll start to see their immune tolerance get better and better because by avoiding the food, now there's no competition with the immune system. So as I rechecked him, uh, he was now at a 5. So as that number goes down, the concentration actually gets higher. And it's a five-fold improvement over where he was before. So we changed his immunotherapy to a PITC and a piperin-5 with the dosing regimen being the same. So two months then after his original his skin was now about 50% better. His face looks almost completely clear. He still had lesions on his arms, neck. Uh, legs and feet are still the worst part of the skin. You know, I don't know if you ever learned this in school, but it was called Herring's Law of Cure. Does that ring a bell to anybody? No. So herring back in the day, this was, I don't know, I think it was the 1600s, identified the way that the body heals. And the body heals from top to bottom, from inside out, in the order of importance. So, you know, the heart will heal before the skin and uh, in reverse order of symptoms. So they teach this in naturopathic medical school as a way to kind of gauge how your patient is doing on the, whatever therapy you're doing, kind of are they following the sort of natural process. And so with skin stuff, especially when you've got someone with eczema that's head to toe, we expect the top to heal before the bottom. If we see the feet clear up and then the face explodes, whatever we're doing is pushing the body in the wrong direction. So I like to see the head, the face, the neck clear up before we see the leg or the hands and the arms and the feet are almost the last thing that you'll see clear up. So again, retested him again. Now his number had changed to a four and a half on both his PITC and Piperin. So again, better improvement. Three months following, skin was much better. Um, I'm sorry, much worse than it was before, and kind of back to where it was before starting the treatment. But now he's starting to get upper respiratory symptoms. He was getting nasal congestion and itchy eyes. And so the difference had been that this family lives in Manhattan. They had gone upstate New York for the summer to vacation, and uh, the child had been out swimming in the lake. And if you've ever been upstate New York, it's very trees, woody area. So there's tons and tons of mold. So now I know this child now just got blasted with a lot of uh, mold spores. So they had just come back from vacation just before our appointment. So I decided to go ahead and test him for mold and found he was allergic to several outdoor molds, uh, catomium, aspergillus, penicillium, cladosporium, mucor. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't put his endpoints here, but... Uh, we went and started him on sublingual immunotherapy for mold, one drop twice a day under the tongue. And the foods, we just kept the same, so we didn't have an extra variable to consider. 
uh, four months at follow-up, so this has been now a month after that, his skin had started to improve again. So he was about 40% better. So he was 50% better before he had the mold exposure, and now he was back about 40%. So we still went, weren't quite back to where we were at his best improvement, but we were starting to see improvement. And again, his congestion and his itchy eyes were now getting better. So I went ahead and increased his mold slit to one drop three times a day, and I rechecked him for his PITC and Pipra, and he had dropped a half dilution. So we made that adjustment down to a four. So another month later, now his skin was about 70% better. He still had a mild nasal congestion, but he wasn't getting itchy eyes. We continued with the mold. Immunotherapy is the same. Again, he had another drop in his PITC and Piperin down to three and a half. So we made that adjustment to his drops. As we kind of kept going on over the next few months, his skin slowly kind of kept improving again. Then his arms and legs got better, uh, finally started to clear up. Again, he would get a few, you know, nasal symptoms when it was a rainy, damp day, but never got any more of the itchy eyes. Again, it's now been a couple of years. His skin's completely clear at this point. It took, a, oh, I think, a, took a total of nine months to get him over the foods. Um, he's still on the, some of the, the mold. Uh, IT because uh, it's still something that's very much part of his environment. And it's kind of funny because the following year they went, did the same thing for their vacation. They've got a home upstate New York. They went back again and I was kind of waiting for the bomb to drop and to get a call that, you know, his skin erupted. But fortunately, same thing. He was swimming in the lake. He was upstate and really didn't have any problems. So that was really exciting to see. Okay, well, I think that's our, our, our presentation for now. Do we have any uh, questions in our last few minutes? Yes? Well, the intention of when you're doing slit is still the same. They're still going to get back to eating their normal diet. You know, it's, it's not right or wrong. It's just different. I could have very easily done LDA with this child. You know, I came out of the camp of doing subling luminotherapy. I have a lot more experience with it. I just know clinically it works. My experience with LDA probably hasn't been as good as other people. It's helped some people, but I've had much better, and I'd say faster improvement with the slit therapy. My experience with LDA, for the people it works on, it still takes longer to get clinical improvement, but it is nice because you don't have as much dietary restriction. So it, it kind of just depends on the person. If you have someone you know who's really not going to be compliant with dietary changes, LDA is definitely the way to go. But if you have someone that can manage the diet, you'll probably find faster improvement with slit. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, you know, do we see improvement with slit therapy for people that have, you know, strong histamine reactions? So I was talking to a woman earlier about like reactive mastocytosis. I've seen, you know, a handful of patients that have this very severe mast cell reactivity where they dump tons of histamine and, and slit can be very effective. You know, the challenge again is what is the trigger? It's not always food. A lot of times it is. So, you know, you have to kind of go through the patient history and identify what the different allergen is. You know, the thing that I think is the most frustrating about any allergy testing, none of it tells you how much it bothers them. You know, you don't really know until you go forward and treat it. And, if, you know, you see 70% improvement, you know it's 70% of the problem. But as much as we want to translate what we see on our skin testing or on paper, Sometimes it correlates and sometimes it doesn't. So you just kind of have to keep picking away at all the things you see in their environment that might be a potential trigger. But the bottom line is, yes, for these histamine reactions that are not anaphylactic, you can see good improvement with slit therapy. Okay, there was a lot of parts of that question. <laughs> so the question was really about, you know, do we do any kind of genetic testing for your ability to really kind of detoxify? And with specific, you know, regards to mold, again, this is where at the beginning I said there's a difference between mycotoxicity. So a lot of what Dr. Shoemaker is talking about is your inability to get rid of mycotoxins, which is completely different than what your immune system is doing as an allergic reaction to mold spores. And in some cases, you have patients that have both problems. So they really are addressing different things. And... I typically don't because it doesn't change treatment. You know, your genes are your genes. You know, we have to work around that. 
So I will disagree with Dr. Shoemaker on his approach that, you know, he feels like you got to be on binders the rest of your life to get rid of it. I think the bigger problem for most people is actually the allergic reaction to mold. Because when you've got mycotoxicity, you've got a limited time to which you've had that exposure. You know, you were in a water damage building that had stachybotrys, ketomium, whatever it is. You know, the biggest thing that helps mycotoxic people is getting out of the environment or remediating the mold. Yeah, and I'm not saying that the binders don't work at all. I mean, certainly for a lot of people they do. But I think that, you know, part of what I think, you know, is missing from his protocol is that there's no addressing the mold allergy piece at all. And mold allergy reaction can cause, and, you know, even symptom-wise, you know, what's mycotoxicity versus mold allergy? I mean, it's very difficult to distinguish which one's creating because they can both cause brain fog and GI problems and so forth. But clinically, I find a lot more people who've been in mold damage buildings benefit from immunotherapy than just treating the mycotoxins by themselves. But again, I test people. I mean, I do you know real-time labs and make sure they don't have mycotoxins. And I do. Uh, I use binding agents. I don't use cholesteramine, but I'll use you know bentonite clay or some other natural binder. Yes. Is that your approach to start? I start very dilute. You know, I think we were the first clinic after Ty doing this, and we first started, we were giving 6C, 7C, and people were getting bombed out. Bombed out. So I now start, uh, for my really sensitive people, for, well, Lyme and Candida specifically, I start at 20. Yeah. If I have someone who might be not as sensitive, I'll start at 18, but I usually don't start below 18 anymore. And then what I'll do is every 10 days, if there's no reaction, I'll titrate down by one dilution. So I'll go from an 18 to a 17 to a 16 every 10 days. Yeah. I'd like to make one comment about the mycotoxins as well. Is that I, th I think what I've seen though is use different binding agents are more effective for different toxins. You know, because you, you know, you've got to look at a combination of things. Uh, you know, for instance, like the new one, the gliotoxin, I think betonite um, in is actually more effective and then you might go to your cholestyramine but we've also found that bile salts are helpful to empty the gallbladder and get get some of that stuff released so you can really absorb it uh, and and you know really important is that you get a really good antioxidant program going to help with phase one two and three detoxification and 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 like Darren I don't waste my time on on those markers. Unfortunately, I I, I knew Richie. I, I knew him when he first well in 2004. You know, I'd, I'd gone to the first course I went of his, and since then I've I've not really found much value looking at the HLA markers. Uh, I think you just gotta figure out what toxin you got and what absorbent's going to work for it best. And I think some of the best work I've seen is on that's done by uh, Neil Nathan actually. And, out in California and and he has a, a variance in some of the methylation protocols and, and we don't have time to go into that either but but basically uh, really heavy-duty mitochondrial support all right thank you